it was really, you know, with the conversion model, the reason we love it is there's so much value on the back ends of these projects because we were taking, or we still are taking, you know, empty retail buildings, warehouse buildings that are valued at what a vacant retail building is valued at and mm -hmm. doing the, you know, asset class conversion, converting it to a self-storage. Um, and then, a, you know, when it's a self-storage, it's valued at a different, uh, you know, different cap rate, different, you know, you change all the numbers that you evaluate this property at, and there's, there's a ton of equity on these projects. Are you looking to achieve massive success in your life without dealing with costly investment nightmares? If yes, then this is the podcast for you. Here, we provide engineers and busy professionals all the secrets and strategies to create multiple streams of income, build generational wealth, and live a meaningful life by design. Here's your host, Ted Patel. Welcome, Decoding Fact Cashflow listeners. Today, we have a great guest, Levi Hemingway. Uh, he's a director of construction and expansion at Nomad Capital. He has been a general contractor for past nine years and has overseen the renovation or ground up construction development for over 500,000 square feet of commercial construction. He oversees all of the day-to-day -day operations at Nomad Capital, including closing process, capital markets, and asset management. He's married and has three kids, love spending time on a boat, and uh, he also likes stage acting. That's interesting. Uh, well, welcome, Levi. Uh, welcome to the show. It's nice to have you here. Thank you so much, Ted. So glad to be here. All right. Yeah, I, I, I like that part, the last part that I said, right? Um, acting. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll touch up on that in a later part of the podcast. But Please to start do. with, yeah. So uh, uh, to start with, uh, if you can give a little background of uh, about yourself, you know, what do you do? How did you get started in the real estate and what do you do right now? What's your main focus? Yeah, so um, I am uh, 28 years old um, and I got into real estate and construction out of high school. Um, I was homeschooled my whole life. And um, so uh, I was a volunteer firefighter when I was just graduated high school. Um, and I was kind of deciding between two paths to do. Um, we had just relocated to Wilmington, North Carolina, and my dad was restarting his business here. And so um, he was, you know, doing work for other people and just trying to get his business off the ground again. And so I was a volunteer firefighter and he was doing that at the same time. Um, so my wife and I got married, uh, young and I told her, I said, Hey, I, I think I want to work with my dad while I can, you know, I don't know what, yeah. how long he's going to be doing what he's doing. And I think I'd rather, you know, I want to just work with my dad. And she said, yeah, that's great. You know, you should, you should do that. So I joined my dad when I was 18. Um, and we had spent several years traveling abroad. Um, mm -hmm. my parents actually took all of us. I'm one of six. Uh, and they took all of us for a three and a half year trip living on a sailboat. And we ended up wow. sailing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, we bought the boat in Greece um, and we ended up sailing the boat over three and a half years back to the United States and re relocating in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. So um, I can I'll tell a little more of that story about Nomad and where the brand comes from. But um, so, yeah, he was kind of starting over. My dad has a big background in construction, 28, 29 years now. And, um, so we got our tools, we got tool bags from Harbor Freight and started working from other, for other people, um, local investors doing, uh, you know, renovations for them, framing, um, just kind of anything we could, you know, starting the business over. And so, uh, we did that for about two years. And after two years, my dad said, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> I don't want to do this for long term. We were framing houses uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina in the summer. And um, one summer of that, my dad says, I, I can't do this long term. Let's let's um, let's go back to commercial real estate. So we're originally from Arizona and my dad built his first self-storage facility there in 2006 um, and held it. He still owns it to this day. We actually just expanded that facility um, earlier this year. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the ways we were able to travel long term was the cash flow from this self storage facility, um, and then was helping us get started back here in Wilmington. The cash flow was, you know, kind of covering the bills until we could get the business going. Um, and so 2016, him and I said, "Hey, let's start to do self storage again because it's it's been really good." And so we had two divisions of the company. It was just me and him at the time. I was doing residential spec building. 
Um, we did a few customs in there, a few renovations, um, and he was kind of focusing on the commercial side of it. So we would, um, you know, do a spec house, build it, sell it, and take every bit of proce uh, proceeds from that and invest it into commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did that for several years and we sort of bootstrapped our first, our portfolio that we own um, without investors. Um, and we did a conversion here in Wilmington, bought a building, converted to self-storage. Um, refinance that, put all the equity into another self-storage facility here locally. Um, same thing, refinance, kept pulling cash out and just kind of building our own portfolio. Um, and we'd heard this idea about syndication, about, hey, you know, raising money from investors or partnering with investors and and doing deals together. And we really wanted to build a base of our cash flowing properties before we started that company. Um, so we, we bootstrapped that for about five years with him and I, before we started, um, Nomad Capital, which is currently what we're doing now. And so, um, so now we do, uh, self-storage syndication and we focus in on conversions in the Southeast. Pretty interesting, man. Uh, love the, love your story and love the part that you spend like three and a half years on boat. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, that's, uh, that's amazing. Uh, you know? Yeah. Uh, so what what brought brought you back to Wilmington? Uh, we ran out of money. <laughs> um, so we had my parents had always talked about traveling abroad as a family. Um, you know, living in an RV, living on a boat, and so we had an opportunity to go to Costa Rica in 2007. My dad had an opportunity to build homes down there, um, luxury homes. Mm -hmm. Um, 2008 happened, and nobody was buying or building a second home in Costa Rica. And so uh, my dad and my mom said, hey, let's, you know, there's not much to go back to the States right now for. My dad had sold a piece of commercial property at the very end of 2007, had some money. And um, they said, hey, do you guys want to do this? And we were homeschooled um, our whole lives. And so the idea of taking our school books onto a boat was, you know, we took our school books down to Costa Rica anyway. So it was nothing different for us. Um, and the original plan was, hey, let's live on a boat for a year um, sail around Greece. I mean, who doesn't want to, you know, live in Greece on a boat for a year. And so, um, six months into the trip, my mom became pregnant with my younger brother. And so my dad said, Hey, let's, you know, do you want to cut the trip short? Um, and my mom said, no, people have babies all around the world, you know, let's, yeah. let's figure this out. <laughs> uh, so my brother was born in Israel. Um, and so we went there for the first winter and then, um, more and more people started to encourage us that we could cross the ocean in this boat. And so we ended up sailing across the Mediterranean, um, down the coast of Africa, uh, out to Cape Verde islands, and then across the, uh, how big was ocean. the boat? A uh, 37 foot catamaran. So, and, uh, you crossed the ocean with 37 feet? We crossed the ocean, eight people, 18 days, 350 square feet. Wow. Oh, so, we, uh, we that, got that's... very close as a family. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's and, a uh, big risk, right? And, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's big. Yeah. All right. So why Wilmington? So we, um, originally from Arizona and my yeah. parents knew they wanted to restart somewhere new. We, we wanted to be near the water cause we just lived on it for three and a half years. Um, so they knew they wanted to be on the East coast somewhere and we kind of narrowed it mm -hmm. down to Charleston, Savannah or Wilmington, um, mm -hmm. and started in Wilmington and, just fell in love with it here and said, yeah, this is where we're going to start over. So um, just kind of, we'd heard some other people say, Hey, Wilmington's a great place. Like, you know, check it out and, yeah. and see if you like it. And, um, and we love it here. So. Yeah. yeah. It, it's a happening state, right? Uh, yeah. it, uh, uh, the population growth, uh, the economy, uh, everything is coming up in that area, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so you, uh, you mentioned you started with, uh, uh, you know, flipping the house, like, you know, uh, doing some ground up construction as a general contractor for a house. And then you, then you switched over to self storage. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what made you switch over to the self storage? Well, like building houses, you already had an experience doing that. Mm -hmm. So what, what is a pivotal moment that made you switch to and to focus on self storage? Yeah. So the, the biggest, um, the biggest reason for us was, um, we did our first fix and flip and we bought a two bedroom, one bath house that we mm -hmm. added onto the back and added another bedroom and bathroom. So we took a two, one and made it a three, two, um, and just did all the work that it took to do the construction. My dad and I did every bit of it. We framed it. We laid the block, we poured the concrete, um, 
you know, we hung the cabinets trim. Um, mm. we did all of that. Um, and then, so it was this idea that, you know, we built this house, there's a lot of equity there. We sold the house, um, get a nice paycheck. And then basically the idea is like, go start again and do the same process over again. Um, and so we'd had these conversations and the self storage in Arizona was doing very well. And it was paying my dad every month and he was not working on it. You know, he was doing, he was framing, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so we kind of had these two things going at the same time. We had this, the spec houses that were going. And again, at the end of the project, you know, here in Wilmington, we could probably get a house built and sold within six to eight months, depends on the permits and the time of year. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, six to eight months, you get this check at the end. Um, and then you've got to go over and start doing it over and over again. And you've got mm -hmm. to be, you know, working on it actively in order to make that check at the end. So, mm -hmm. um, when the self storage was doing well, it was like, Hey, let's take this cash that we're making and let's invest it into something that's going to pay us maybe a little bit less as these projects lease up. But over time, Hey, we're going to get, you know, $5,000 a month from the storage or 10,000 or whatever it may be. But once we get that set up and it's stable, you know, that's passive income, right? And yeah. we can get that set up. And now we don't have to, you know, there's still management stuff like, you know, you're never truly uh, passive. You're never going to go to the property that doesn't exist, but the idea is, hey, let's get this set up. And then it's paying us every month as if it were a spec house and we're not working on it every month. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of the, the pivotal moment for us as we had an existing self-storage facility doing well, you know, comboed with we were doing this spec houses and saying, hey, this is a lot of work and we've got to keep doing this in order to keep making money. We're going to have to just do this. You know, it's just mm -hmm. kind of a hamster wheel. Um, yeah. So that's that was one of the reasons we said, hey, we know self-storage. We know how to how to do that. Um, and so that was the asset class that we picked in. Um, and also, you know, self-storage was a cheaper barrier to entry than multifamily. Um, you know, it typically is just a, a cheaper asset yeah. because the build outs less and um, it's just a lot less expensive of a building. You don't have, you know, a hundred toilets, hundred granite countertops, a yeah. hundred sinks um, and all kitchens. that stuff. Yeah. Kitchens, yeah. flooring, you know, we don't have yeah. to make it. I mean, we make it look pretty, but yeah. at the end of the day, it's, it's self storage. Like, so yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the main thing, what I got is the passive income part of the store self storage that attracted you towards this uh, niche, right? Absolutely. And, uh, and, and that's, more, uh, I would say it's necessary, right? Everyone needs to have a passive income stream, uh, um, in addition to active income, if they have any, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that, uh, they can sustain on the passive income the same way you did on the boat for three and a half years. Uh, yeah. yeah and have the freedom and luxury to spend time wherever they want. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the, that's the, uh, idea behind our company. Nomad capital is, you know, we lived like nomads for three and a half years. And we want to help other people achieve that same goal of being able to work and live and travel how they want. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that the way you can do that is through commercial real estate, um, yeah. whether it's self storage or multifamily or other assets, I, yeah. you know, we truly believe real estate is a great, you know, it's a great way to build wealth and passive income. And so that's, we want to help people become nomads. So. Awesome, man. Love it. So, uh, Talking about the first deal that you had in Wilmington, right? About the storage facility that you converted. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us something more about it? How did you find that? And what are the things or what was the process that you went through to convert that to the storage facility? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we typically find our best deals when we're having a beer or hanging or networking with people is typically <laughs> how we get our best work done. Um, so my dad and my mom were having a, a beer at a, at a brewery downtown Wilmington and, um, and they were sitting there talking and the building was across the street. And my dad said, Hey, that, I wonder what that building is. That would be a great self-storage building. Um, so he went over there with his phone flashlight and took a picture of the, the broker number and, uh, called him the next day and said, Hey, I want to, you know, look at this building. Um, so he got into the building and he, he wrote a contract for it. Um, the building was for sale for, I believe around 900,000 at the time. Um, so he put it under contract, wasn't sure what the next steps were, but, um, we are the type of people that is, um, we're just going to keep the ball moving forward until we hit roadblocks that we can't, that we can't push through. Um, so he tied it up and got in touch with a local lender, started to try to figure all that out. 
And right away when he tied it up, the broker came to him and said, hey, here's the two. But this building had been vacant for six years and for sale for four years. So it's it, downtown Wilmington. We still own that one. Mm-hmm. And right in the good area. But this building is just kind of goofy and kind of ugly and just just nobody could figure out what to do with it. So the broker said, hey, um, here's two estimates to demolish the building. Here's one for 80000 one for 120000 And my dad said, why would I demolish it you know and they said oh well we didn't we don't know what you want what are you going to do with this building you know um Mm -hmm. and so he he didn't tell them we were planning to do self-storage but um through a bunch of different roadblocks he ended up finding uh financing through live oak bank uh he did an sba loan um so he was able to do 10 percent down which at the time that was a lot of our capital from uh two flips that we were doing um so went through the SBA route, um, got it funded, and they did the initial purchase plus the renovation uh, mm-hmm. all into one loan plus the you know interest reserves and working capital and all that. So um, so the initial purchase was nine hundred thousand. The renovation was about eight hundred thousand. Um, it's a thirty two thousand square foot building. Um, I'm I'm, I'm thirty four thousand. Excuse me. Um, and so we were able to get about twenty six thousand net rentable square feet there. Um, mm-hmm. so our all in cost was a million seven. Um, and so we bought it and him and I were kind of tag teaming the construction. I was still doing the residential. He was kind of overseeing that one. And then we would kind of switch some days and, you know, we we're both just kind of there getting the job done. Um, so we took about a year to renovate that opened up in 2017, um, and then started leasing up. Um, you know, the SBA loan had some interest reserves. So when we opened the project, we had, um, I think it was 150 or 200,000 of capital that we were using to make the payments while we leased it up. Um, and so that one stabilized in 2019 and the appraised value on it now is 5.5 million. Um, and our all-in cost is 1.7. So it's awesome, man. uh, It was really, you know, with the conversion model, the reason we love it is there's so much value on the back ends of these projects because we were taking, or we still are taking, you know, empty retail buildings, warehouse buildings that are valued at what a vacant retail building is valued at and mm-hmm. doing the, you know, asset class conversion, converting it to a self storage. Um, and then, a, you know, when it's a self storage, it's valued at a different, uh, you know, different cap rate, different you know, you change all the numbers that you evaluate this property at, and there's, there's a ton of equity on these projects. So, I mean, you could do it, you know, with any converting a a mill or a warehouse to multifamily, you know, I think that there's a lot of value when you're converting one asset class to another in any kind of commercial real estate. Um, And we really like that, that heavy value add aspect. And you need to have an eye for that, right? I to see that spread when you convert how much uh, difference it will be priced per square feet. You need to know that, I, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. So how, how do you, what, what is the uh, uh, evaluation model for the uh, storage facilities? Like when you get a new deal, how do you evaluate? Okay, this is a good fit for me. This is not. Yeah. So any specific data points yeah. that you take look at, you know? Yeah. So we look at a lot of different data points, um, very similar to multifamily or any, any other, you know, um, commercial real estate um, class. Um, so we look at obviously occupy or, you know, density in the area and the markets that we're going into. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a metric in self-storage that's square foot per capita. So basically the amount of existing self-storage per the amount of people that are in this city. Um, Mm -hmm. and so that's a big number that storage guys go off of, you know, how saturated is that market already? Um, and then, you know, diving into that further, how saturated is that market with climate controlled storage versus just regular drive up storage? Because, um, especially in the Southeast, there's a premium for climate controlled storage because it's so humid down here in the summer. And so you Mm -hmm. put your, you know, you put your belongings into a regular storage facility that's not climate controlled. You've got a lot of humidity. You could have mold, you could have warping of wood products. So, people really like the climate controlled aspect because it's temperature controlled. You know, you've got, you're controlling the humidity there. So um, Mm -hmm. that's a big metric that we look at a square foot per capita. And then we'll look at um, the cost of the building, um, how much it is exist, you know, how much we're buying the shell for, because we're basically going in and we're gutting everything inside anyways. Um, So what's our cost per square foot to buy it? And then what's going to be our cost per square foot to renovate it. Um, And so, those two numbers obviously are a big impact of, of 
you know, our all in costs for the project. Um, and then of course we'll look at, you know, median income, household income, um, population growth, all, all the same kind of metrics of, Hey, is this a market we want to be in? Um, is this growing? Is it, you know, we focus a lot in, um, tertiary markets outside of major metros. So Mm -hmm. in North Carolina, we're not in Raleigh. We're in the surrounding parts of Raleigh, you know, the the suburbs. Yeah. yeah. The places where people can still afford a house and they're okay to commute 30 to 45 minutes because the cost of living is, you know, drastically cheaper. Um, so we like those markets a lot and we feel like we can play in those, those markets because as soon as you go to, you know, major metros, you're competing with, you know, REIT money and, and institutional capital and, we, we, our checkbook is not that big. So, um, so we, we like the secondary markets for sure. Right. And when you mentioned, uh, per, uh, uh, square feet per capita, right. Those mm-hmm. kind of matrix, what are the places you look, uh, you know, or research for the, to get those kind of matrix? Yeah. So we subscribe to, um, we use CoStar, um, for a lot of our property data and mm-hmm. information data on, on square footage of the actual property. Um, we use radius plus, um, is a storage um, site that is that's very helpful and they've got a lot of data on there. Um, and then our acquisitions team spends a lot of time um, cold calling, um, just the old fashioned, you know, picking up the phone and, um, you know, we'll use Google Maps and just map out, you know, we're typically looking at a three to five mile radius. Maybe we'll look at a seven mile radius from our actual site. Um, but, you know, three miles from us, you know, anything over five miles, people aren't going to travel that much further unless of course it's on a way in you know if you got a suburb here and, and somebody's traveling into work so um you know we'll kind of map out the facilities near us and then we start to do a lot of cold calling of uh secret shopping hey um you know do you guys have availability what's your pricing um and a lot of times you know they'll you know if it's if it's an undersupplied market that you know the manager like no I'll, let me put you on a wait list we don't have any units we've we not had any for months or, you know, you kind of get a lot of this data just straight from boots on the ground people at, at your competitors facilities. Um, and so that's, that's really one of the best ways we get actual data of what's happening there. Um, and then of course, seeing if, you know, if we go into a market and there's a lot of storage around us, but it's all drive up and not climate controlled, we obviously take that into effect, but it's mm-hmm. kind of playing in a different way for us because we're kind of we're, we're offering a different product and a different service than this other storage, right? It's still self storage, um, but but there is people that will pay fifteen twenty dollars more for this climate control than mm-hmm. if there's if it's undersupplied. Then we don't really feel like we're competing. Um, there's several markets we're in that we have good con- good relationships with other facilities that have no climate controlled. Um, and so we say, Hey, we have climate controlled. Um, and in areas that we don't have climate controlled, if somebody is just looking for a cheaper rate, we're happy to send them, you know, to the other facility because we don't have what they're looking for. So, um, yeah. Okay. And, uh, uh, the climate control versus non-climate climate control. What's, uh, you said the premium per, uh, hundred square feet would be about 20, $30. It depends. I, I don't know if we have that exact metric, that exact number amount. It, uh-huh. Again, depends on the market. But yeah, I would say if you're looking at just, just maybe 20%. Around, yeah, 20, maybe 20 for round numbers, probably about 20% more um, okay. that people will pay for that. Uh, I mean, in some markets, it'll be as high as 50% more. Or in some markets where it's really tight, it may only be 5% more, you know, so it, it kind of depends. On, but I'd say probably 20% is about the average of of higher rates versus non-climate. <laughs> and what is the occupancy rate that you that you have normally in the storage facilities? Eight ninety percent, ninety five percent. How do you measure? You know, what's your yeah, so average our, occupancy? Uh, so currently, we have several projects in lease up, so our occupancy is lower because we're leasing projects up. But mm-hmm. um, across our stable portfolio, we're sitting about ninety percent occupied, ninety two percent occupied. <clears throat> okay. And that's really kind of where you want to be. No higher than ninety five percent is kind of the the target um because if you're 100 full you know you're not charging enough rents there and so we would rather be you know occupied at 92 percent um up to 95 percent or 90 with a higher market rents there so that's what so we that, that's, that's the we soft spot Absolutely. around 95 percent plus minus all right okay and where do you get your leads from like uh 
what else, what are your main, uh, you know, funnels? Um, our main funnels are probably CoStar. Um, we use okay. CoStar a lot. Um, and we'll typically, if we find a property, even that's for sale, we'll try to get in touch with the owner. Um, you know, not to bypass the brokers, but we at least like to have a conversation with them. And, um, you know, if they say, Hey, we've got it listed, then we say, yeah, we'll, we'll go through them. We just wanted to tell you who we are. Um, so we do a lot through, um, CoStar, um, LoopNet, just the, just the normal sites that we typically find. Um, you know, you're nowadays, you're not going to, you're not going to find a self-storage facility listed on, you know, a mom and pop facility. You most likely won't find it listed on LoopNet, but if you are looking for a, grocery store that's been empty for six years that's just a vacant commercial building you know we might find those there so um you know again it's we love that model of we're not competing for a storage facility when it hits the market um because over the last three years there's been so much money coming into the space and anytime something gets listed you know we're on all the email lists for the national bro brokers <clears throat> excuse me and everything is call for offers, call for offers. And we're just, you know, driving the price up and and we're buying at, you know, low cap rates and it's, and we don't like that. Um, but, you know, several of our buildings have that we have acquired and renovated have been for sale for three years and nobody wants them. But as soon as we convert it to self storage, then we start getting the calls from the brokers and the other people saying, Hey, we see you got a self storage, you know, can, do you want to yeah. sell it? Um, so, but when it was, you know, the building's been sitting there for, for several years, but nobody wanted it in its current state. So, yeah. Um, and, yeah. And, and it's a uh, construction background, right? That gives you an edge. Yeah. Uh, it, it helps you determine, you know, how much uh, uh, renovation cost uh, you know, would be there. It gives you an idea. Uh, uh, and uh, compared to the, compared to the institutional investor who just wants the stabilized property. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And uh, what do you, what do you think? Like, uh, the regular in your area, let's talk about your specific area, right? If you go for a stabilized self-storage facility, what would be the normal uh, cost per square feet versus what would be the uh, cost per square feet when you convert yeah. an empty building into a storage facility? So you're, you're talking like ground up construction? Like no, a new conversion. I'm, yeah. I'm okay. Conversion. So uh, our it's on one side, it's a stabilized property. Mm. If you go and buy it, mm -hmm. price uh, price per square feet, mm -hmm. and on the other side, it's uh, it's a property which you bought and converted into mm -hmm. self storage. What will be the price per quantity, and how do you? So um, it depends on the sale market, um, okay. but self storage trades in the. You know, I mean, it depends on, you know, New York self-storage will trade for five, six hundred dollars a square foot or more. Um, our so last year we did five projects at Nomad Capital. We did five conversion projects um, mm -hmm. and our average project for the building and the conversion was sixty three dollars a foot all in cost. Wow. Um, so we bought a building in Reedsville, North Carolina, and we bought the building for eleven dollars a square foot. It was a ninety thousand square foot Kmart. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, $11 a foot, if you're in construction, you know, you, you can't do the site work and pour the concrete for that. You know, yeah. you, you can't touch yeah. that. Uh, um, I know, I know I'm in construction business, yeah. as I said, right. Yeah. So I know what 63 is like, you can do nothing for 63. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So our all in cost across our five projects last year was $63 a foot. Um, and so, you know, just to do ground up construction, you know, you're probably looking at 120 to $140 a foot plus the cost of the land. Um, so if you look at it on a cost basis there, you know, we're, we're all into these projects for, for, you know, half of the, half of the costs and it's, and it's a complete finished product, you know, it's ready mm -hmm. to open, ready to rent units, the offices in place, the, the doors work. I mean, you, you're right. It's cameras up. Um, mm -hmm. so that's, that's one of the biggest, I think, advantages of conversion right there is just like straight cost per square foot, you know, just looking at replacing the building cost. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, our first conversion we bought for 1.5 million and the appraisal said, yeah, this, the building as it is, is worth $5 million because you, you know, you can't build this back there for less yeah. than 5 million. Um, so, and then from the sale price, you know, we would take a project that's our, our all in for $63 a foot or around that range there. And, you know, a conservative number would be 150 to $175 a foot for storage in North Carolina. 
Um, if you're near Charlotte, you're probably looking at closer to $200 a foot um, sale price. So, you know, there's a tremendous amount of value there uh, on the back end. Um, and so that's, that's part of our strategy is, you know, investors invest with us. We take the building down, we'll do the conversion. Um, and then we open the building, we stabilize the property within three to five years and we'll do a cash out refinance. Um, so we'll give, you know, return all the capital to investors and then they'll get, they'll get their portion of whatever's left there. Um, so their equity position stays the same from then until year 10, if it's a 10 year project for us. So because, you know, by the time we stabilize our projects in year four or five, our loan to value is 30 to 35%. So there's a lot of room to put some more debt on it. You yeah. know, we can refinance for 60 or 65% and not stress the asset, um, but pull a lot of capital out and return it to our investors. And because it's a refinance, our investors aren't paying tax on that because it's refinance a way mm -hmm. of, of debt. Yeah. Um, so our investors get their money back. They get, they get capital in year five, they get, you know, there's a cash event. Um, and then we can just ride the cash flow from year, you know, four to 10 or five to 10 or whatever it is. So, mm -hmm. um, we really like the a lot of options around when we refinance, you know, how much debt do we want to put on? How much capital do we want to pull out? Um, and we feel like we have all those options because we're our cost basis is is very, very low. Very low. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um in the building, right? What the building that you look around for conversion, what are the specific criteria for that building that, that you look like? Okay, this needs to be uh, X, Y, Z square feet. It needs mm -hmm. to be this much height. It needs to be in uh, uh, a certain suburb or mm -hmm. uh, the zoning uh, aspect. What are the things that you consider while looking for a building for conversion? Uh, almost all those things. So yeah, zo zoning is a big one. Obviously, we'll look at the zoning that is in. We've had to do several rezones, um, rezone them or get a special use permit mm -hmm. during the planning process. Um, we look at the location, of course, um, to make sure it's in a good area. We want good visibility. Um, and then the square footage of the building, we probably will look 40,000 square feet and, and bigger just because, mm -hmm. you know, somebody told me a long time ago, if you're going to mobilize to do a project, it's almost the same amount of work to do a 10,000 square foot building as it is to do a hundred thousand square foot building. You know, you just have to take a little more time to do it, but the effort is almost there. Almost um, the same, yeah. So we, we look at about 40,000 square feet and bigger. Um, and then we'd love to end up with about at least 50,000 net rentable square feet or higher. So we'd really need to be looking at buildings that are about 65 to 70,000 square feet to achieve that. Um, just because there's a lot of other groups and bigger institutional capital groups that want at least 50,000 square feet. And so mm -hmm. we can if we can get a big enough project um, it just kind of opens up our buyer pool a little bit more when we go to sell it in five or 10 years. So, um, and how many units do you build in 50,000 square feet normally? I know it, uh, all the unit varies in size, but cumulative yeah. together. Yeah. And, and a 50,000 square foot building. Um, so we just did one in Macon, Georgia that we just opened up. The building was 62,000 square feet total. Um, and we ended up with 48,000 of net rentable storage there. Mm -hmm. um, and we have just under 500 units. Okay. So um, we're, we're happy with that. And, um, you know, we're trying to get as much rentable square footage of the building as we can. Um, Cause you know, you have to take away areas for hallways, loading yes. zones, office, mm -hmm. bathroom, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's probably about right. About 500 units for 50,000 square feet. Okay. So. Right. And uh, let's change the gears and move on to the syndication aspect of your business. Right. Mm -hmm. So well, when did, when you got into syndication, how did you start? Did you do like 501c, B, uh, started a fund or maybe, you know, what, what yeah. was the initial stage? Yeah. So we, um, we'd been going to um, best ever real estate conference out in uh, Colorado. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, I was there this year. Oh, so yeah. were we. Are you going again this year? Or? Uh, yeah, I'll be going. Okay. Well, we'll see you there then. Um, yeah, sure. So we, we'd gone to this conference and learned about syndication and about what do you do, what do you not do, and um, just trying to figure it all out. So um, when we started, we started as a 506B. We are still 506B to this day. 
Mm -hmm. um, started at a very local level and, um, you know, no, no general solicitation. We do all of our, um, all of our investors are, we're building those relationships with them, all those substantive mm -hmm. relationships. And so, um, so we started as 506B and we still are a 506B uh, syndication group. So accredited and not accredited investors. Sounds good, man. And what, what is your uh, structure, like uh, the, the cash out or distribution structure in your syndication? Do you start distribution once the property is stabilized, the conversion is completed? How, do, how does it work? Or do you start the con cash, you know, uh, distribution while the property is in renovation? Yeah. So we, we talked a lot about this when we started our, you know, how do we want to structure this? Yeah. Um, and we talked about starting distributions day one, but what it came down to is we were just going to have to raise more capital and then yeah. pay investors with other investors money just so they could get a return on it. Um, and we didn't like that model. So we said, Hey, look, you know, this is not a stable asset. Um, we're not buying existing cash flow. We're building exist, you know, we're going to build the cash flow out. So, yeah. Um, investors invest with us. Um, there's typically a 12 month build time. Um, of course, if we can do it quicker, we will, but typically with municipalities and permitting and all yeah. that. Um, so we target a 12 month build and then we'll open the doors, um, and then start the lease up and we get a feasibility study for all of our projects. So we get a study from a, a third party group that says, Hey, storage will work here here's what you can expect for lease up. Here's what you can expect for rents. Um, and we always put that with our own internal underwriting. And it's always, we typically underwrite more conservative than a third party person, um, mm -hmm. which is great. We would rather be more conservative and set ourselves up for nice surprises, you know, so we yeah, can hey, m maybe yeah. uh, get to stabilization a couple months sooner, but Hey, let's plan for worst case scenario. Yeah. Um, so then we stabilize the property in about, 18 to 24 months depends on the size of the facility. Obviously a bigger facility is going to take longer to lease up because we have mm -hmm. just more units. Um, and then we will start cash distributions to our investors quarterly. Um, so our investors get a preferred return from day one when they invest with us. It's just accruing while we're building up. Um, okay. So the, the, the pref or the preferred return starts accruing from day one. And so once we open up, we're starting to pay back that back owed pref. Um, and then when that's caught up, then the distributions go um, pro rata per the interest of the, of the syndication group. So. Um, and what is your normal uh, LPGP model? Like uh, your, uh, uh, the ratio between LPGP. Yeah. So, um, so our, our ratios are a little bit different. Um, okay. Again, we're not from this space. So we, um, we do everything a little bit differently, but um, our typical split is about um, 35, 65. So 35 for LP, 65 for GP. Um, and we do that for a couple of different reasons. So one of them being, um, you know, we sign recourse debt for all of our projects. So my dad and I mm -hmm. are signing the note for all these. We don't use any bridge. We don't use any, um, um, variable rate, um, hard money loans. We're getting actual financing on these that are, that are recourse projects. Um, and then because we're able to create as much value as we are, we can, our returns for our investors are right in what the market is seeing, if not stronger than, than what is out there for self storage. Um, so we can still offer our investors a great return. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're able to keep a, a decent part of the, the, to, of the GP for that. Um, Another reason we we like to hold on to more of the the ownership interest is, you know, if you have, and I think we're seeing it in some of the some of the syndication groups now, you know, if the GP only has you know eight or or you know ten or twenty percent interest in the project, you know, if things turn, you know, if if capital markets are rough, then there's a lot less incentive for the general partner, in my opinion, to make the project work and and you know stay in the project. So. Um, we view it as, um, you know, we have a lot more to lose as well. So we are, we are obviously vested in this project. And if things are to go South, if we need to give up more of the GP to our limited partners to make them whole, then we have the freedom and the flexibility to do that. So, um, we look at it as kind of a buffer in up and down markets, kind of like we're in now with interest rates, crazy high and, yeah. you know, everybody, you know, wars going on. Um, we like to hold, a, you know, as much as we can there so we can make sure our investors are taken care of and that just will come out of our side. So, so it's like you're all in. 
absolutely uh, on that side every time most of absolutely. the time i would say and yep. uh, during the distribution side like what is a split gp uh, lp split before uh like before. Do, um it's typically 35 percent to investors and 65 to gp is that the question okay. No, that, that is an investment perspective, right? Uh, you invest like 65 in the project, help the other other investors uh, put 35 in the project, right? Oh, oh, you're talking about an initial investment? In, initial, that's what you said? Or okay, yeah, did sorry, I, I, it, I uh, misunderstood the other way around? there. Yeah, no, um, so yeah, we, we invest in all of our deals um, and it depends on the deal, the deal size or how much we'll put in, but we'll typically put in um, several hundred thousand dollars Mm -hmm. um, of our own capital in each deal. Uh, and then the distribution payout is the 65, 35. 35. Okay. Yeah. No, it's more yep. clear. Sorry. Okay. So, all right. Uh, how do you see the storage market moving forward? Like, uh, in, with the current, uh, environment, right. Commercial space, CRE, everyone's saying going down, you know, the, uh, because yeah. of the interest rate, uh, there is just too much stressed out properties out there. How do you, mm -hmm. how do you see the near future? Yeah. Um, you know, nobody has a crystal ball. I mean, yep. you know, we would all love to have one, but, um, you know, for the most part, self-storage has always been an asset that has done very well in, um, in recession times. Um, there's a lot of data, you know, 20, you know, self-storage has performed very well over the last 20 years through 2008 occupancy remained high. Um, and it's becoming more of a necessity for people nowadays. Um, there's a lot of data that comes out from national brokers and national economists that show, you know, which populations or which age demographics and groups are using self-storage. Um, so millennials, which is my age um, demographic, um, we make up for about 34% of the U.S. population now. And we are currently using 38% of all existing self-storage. Um, so you know, for the last several years, everyone's kind of said, hey, what's the next generation? You know, what are millennials? What are Gen Z? How are they going to be using self-storage? Are they going to not use it as much as the past generations? Um, and the data is showing the opposite. They're actually using more self-storage than the previous generations because the cost of living is going up and the cost of housing and rental is going up. Um, so people will, you know, maybe they won't rent a two bedroom apartment for $1,800. They'll rent a one bedroom apartment for $1,200 and then they'll get a hundred dollar storage unit, um, to put their bikes and their, you know, their toys into, um, we're also seeing an interesting shift in, you know, people used to visit their self storage unit about four times a year, you know, once a quarter spring cleaning, you know, summer, fall, Christmas decorations, um, and now people are starting to use it, you know, maybe once or twice a month. Um, so they really want facilities that are close to apartments. They want them close to, the, you know, downtown. They want them in the area so they can run over there and um, grab their bike or they can run over there and grab their, you know, sort of a closet extension now. Um, so we're, we're super bullish on self-storage. I think it's performed incredibly well over the last um, 20 years um, across the U.S., and, um, and we expect it to continue to grow and, and to be a necessity. Of course, you know, there's saturated markets like any r real estate, I think, but, um, yeah, I think we're, we're, we're really bullish on it. And I think there's always going to be a need for, um, self-storage. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, see the market, as you said, right, there's no crystal, uh, crystal ball, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, it's expected, right. As the market goes down, the market goes up, but on the long term, it's the trajectory for all the real estate assets, mm -hmm. right. Most of them, I would say, uh, is in North side. It goes up yeah. on the long term. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so, uh, Levi, uh, let's move on. Let's change the gears, move on to the last section of the podcast. Are sure. you ready? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, so Levi, which is the one book that you'll recommend, uh, which had the most impact in your life or on your business? That's hard. Um, <laughs> I, I really like, uh, Ryan holiday. Um, I think okay. he's got some great writing. Um, and I love his books because there's a cross between business and personal growth and motivation. Um, mm -hmm. so our core team read obstacles, the way and courage is calling. Um, just fantastic reads. Um, they just get me really fired up about, um, you know, 
taking the challenges in your life and turning them into opportunities and looking at things differently. Um, and I think you have to have that mindset in this, in what we do in commercial real estate, because it's hard and there's a lot of things that go wrong. And, yeah. you know, there's so many external factors that, that, um, matter to our business. Um, and so I love the idea of getting your mindset right. Um, and, you know, being ready for what's to come there. So I'm a big fan of Ryan holiday, uh, and, and his writing. So, yeah, my mindset is a key, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first thing you got to make sure it's, uh, it's right before you get started into any ventures, any business. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what are your main source of information for, to learn and grow? Um, I'm, I, I love podcasts and audiobooks. Um, I am always have a hard time picking up a hard copy of a book. So I'm always listening to audiobooks. Um, and then I, I'm a big believer in, um, just communication like this. I love to network. I love to meet people. Um, we host a, a once a month meetup here in Wilmington and it's commercial real estate meetup. I love to do that. Um, just love hearing about what businesses people are doing and the challenges that they're dealing with. And, and, um, you know, sometimes I may have the solution or they may have the solution to my problem. So I think there's, um, tremendous value in networking. Um, it's been said for, for years, but, um, I think it's, I think it's super valuable. That, that's what I believe too. Like uh, network is your net worth. That, that's what <laughs> is going to, you know, yep. uh, play Absolutely. a big role in your life. All right. Uh, what is the one advice that you'll give to our listeners? Uh, anything personal or business advice? Um, so for the business side, um, you know, I, I was thinking about that question before the podcast. Um, and my advice is, you know, we've scaled uh, very fast, which has been great. And it's been a lot of fun and it's been chaos and it's been all the, th you know, all the emotions. Um, the biggest thing I think we probably could have done better on in our business was documenting what we were doing and creating systems and processes to scale to the next level. Um, so we're currently in the process of kind of going back and really trying to document everything that we do and how we do it. Um, because mm -hmm. everyone on our team has all the knowledge up here and they just, they know what to do and they work and do it. But if that person's out or if we need to replicate that and we need two or three or four people doing this task, um, we're, we're stumbling now and saying, okay, we should have been documenting this of, Hey, here's how you, uh, you know, put a job out for bid. Here's how you do X, you know, all, all these steps. So, um, that's probably been the biggest thing that we're working on now that I would encourage anybody starting and, and, and any business just, Hey, uh, you know, we downloaded loom onto our computers and starting to document the tasks and the way we do things. Um, so I think that's super valuable, even if you don't, you know, even if you just record what you're doing or, or document it somewhere, you know, there's going to be a day where you can have somebody on your team or an admin person or somebody help you organize all that, but at least you have the content. Um, so that's, that's my biggest advice, just because we're going through that right now uh, um, as a company. And it's a lot, I mean, it's, it's, it's good. Cause I know that this is what's going to take for us to scale to the next level. Uh, yeah. Um, and so, right. yeah. it's a great advice. It's a great advice. And uh, I also believe in the process. Right. Yeah. It should be everything needs to be uh, step by step. Everything needs to be documented. So if there is any any other person you want to onboard on your team, it's very easy for them to yeah. grasp what you're doing, how you do it. And, uh, you know, and and it sets the stage. Right. These are your criteria. This is how it's done. And he might be doing uh, the same thing in the other way, but mm -hmm. you want him to fit in. uh in the same flow that you have in your company. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, Levi, it was nice talking to you. Uh, oh, before, before we end the show, how can Decoding Cashflow listeners get in touch with you? Uh, probably our website. We've got a contact on our website. Um, it's nomadcapital.us. Um, there's a, there's a contact form there, um, or shoot us an email. Um, the main email is invest at nomadcapital.us. Um, or directly at me, Levi at you know, nomadcapital.us. So um, love to, yeah, love to reach out with anybody. If there's anybody in the Wilmington, Eastern North Carolina that wants to connect, um, we do host a once a month real estate meetup on the second Thursday of every month. Um, and we do have a Facebook group for that. Um, I believe it's Nomad Capital um, Real Estate Meetup. So um, yeah. Awesome. 
All right. Thanks a lot, man. Uh, thanks for being on the show. It was a pleasure talking to you. And uh, we'll stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Really appreciate All right. it. All right. Take care. See you. Thanks for listening to Decoding Cashflow, brought to you by Aster Capital. If you found value in this episode, then please share it with someone who you think could benefit from it. And make sure to act on what you've learned. If you want Ted Patel to personally help you reach your goals, then feel free to set up a one-on-one -on -one call with him. Also, visit us at astercapital.com for more free resources. Content of this podcast is for informational purposes only. As always, please consult your own advisor before making any investment decisions or setting a course of action. Thanks again for joining us on this episode of Decoding Cashflow, and we'll catch you in the next episode.